Uh, I don't know if you heard Erin's sort of throwaway comment there, but she said she also uses that opportunity to identify what their preferences are in terms of pronouns, and I just think that's fantastic. What a way to show respect for our students. Okay, so I believe we're skipping number three because there aren't any curriculum constraints we can all agree on on that. Um, <laughs> So, group number four, approaches for getting, building institutional buy-in and support. Um, good morning. <clears throat> or... Is there another you can just select up here, perhaps? My computer yeah. thinks it's duplicating, but. Uh... Anybody, is there a switch? Or, okay. Let's try one more time. Okay, yeah, so uh, I will be presenting the uh, outcomes of our discussion on approaches for getting and or building institutional buy-in and support. Um, so we're first asked to identify um, key factors to, um, to be dealt with. And so uh, one thing is I think we've all faced uh, just a devaluation of ethics, but it's at all levels and it's pervasive. Um, and so it needs to be addressed at all levels. And it actually extends outside of just the university uh, to society in general, um, to the, the current trends in our society. Um, there's obviously limited infrastructure and resources. Um, there are also competing resources and competing priorities. Um, there is stasis or inertia to be overcome, that things are being done in a certain way, and, and changing them will always meet with amount of resistance. There is defensiveness, um, that being people thinking that saying we need to address these issues makes people feel that currently they are perhaps being attacked or they are not acting ethically. Um, there is uh, a lack of or distorted reward structures for taking on these challenges. Um, and there's also a need for sustained <coughs> efforts, really for us meaning that it needs to be an ongoing process, it needs to be adapted and um, continuing for, for a long time. It's not a, be a one-shot uh, fix. So in terms of uh, promising strategies, for one thing, our conversation very organically drifted into the other affinity topics. And so clearly, this is not going to be 11 separate things that are addressed, that there is a lot of, of overlap, and these things will be addressed together. Um, the other thing that we came to identify is that every institution is unique and different. And we're hoping that some section of what we're presenting today is useful for you, but we're also tailoring it a bit that there's a lot of options. Um, so one thing we think would be helpful is to identify what we're calling the powerful movers at your institution. So a voice in the wilderness, a lone faculty or department trying to affect change is, is going to have a hard time. So identify the structures that tend to make things happen at your university. Um, some ideas were um, advisory committees, such as an industrial advisory committee, uh, the student body themselves, uh, the accreditation boards that you may be dealing with, uh, state legislatures, uh, funding agencies, and scientific communities, such as NSF, NAE, uh, and peer institutions, or uh, many of us, we have institutions that we look at as, as target institutions that we want to um, you know, achieve parity with. So again, 
it's going to be different different institutions. And so identify both the structures that do affect change at your institution, but also the structures that are people or groups that you can influence and, and get some buy-in to support you. Um, and so hopefully some group here you can identify, or, or multiple groups. Um, the other thing that we were thinking about is this needs to be a, a wider effort. Um, so this gives you allies. This gives you momentum. So um, we want us to build relationships across boundaries. And so this is across departments, across schools, um, but also across the faculty and staff and students, everybody um, trying to be involved. Um, something that came up was, uh, I mentioned before, as a drawback or a, a, um, something to be overcome is award structures, that there needs to be, whether it's actual awards or it's just recognition, whether, and then also addressing this in the tenure and promotion um, issues, that there's, there's not motivation for faculty to affect change if it's not going to uh, help them in the long run. Uh, and then also to invoke the current discussions in higher education as a community, as a, as a nation or even global community. Um, we'd also uh, say to connect to existing programs and priorities that are at your university. So, whatever grand challenges or um, you know, large efforts you currently have, often they're in some engineering topic, then try to connect this and connect ethics to that. So this will help you, uh, it, 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 say it enables alignment, so it aligns you with the priorities of your university and gets rid of some of the defensiveness and pushback you may feel. Um, it grounds your discussion, so it's no longer this ethereal concept of ethics and morality. Now you have very clear examples of what it is that you want to do and also what ethics means in certain situations. And this also helps you to have, um, have these uh, ethical programs covering all four years of the undergraduate. And really, I think now we should add graduate education as well. So it's not a one course. It's something that pervades the entire time the students are there. Um, this was not a required slide, but we're, we're breaking the mold a little bit. Uh, a couple pitfalls that we identified. Um, one would be the failure to anticipate pushback um, that you're going to face, but also don't over anticipate and, and defeat yourself before you start. Um, a fine line to tread there. Um, you could fail to identify and enlist the proper allies. And so that was both the power structures, but also the across the board um, reach out. Um, going too fast. So there is inertia, there's momentum. Um, we're engineers, so you know, there's, these are not first order systems, right? You, you need to take some time and, and know things are going to take a little time to, before they change. Um, dilution or co-option of your program to suit other needs, you need to be able to resist that. Um, you, again, you have to tread the line between whether it is across all the curriculum or a single shot. Uh, and then also, uh, be curious to hear what the assessment group is talking about, but we think there can be a tendency to obsess about gathering data and assessing it and trying to figure out what that is at the cost of developing your programs. Um, so what can we as attendees do? We would really like to encourage everyone to stay in contact with your affinity groups and maybe even with the people that you've just met here outside of the affinity groups. So we could establish a mailing list, um, could have a conference call that's scheduled for some time in the future to discuss what has happened. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to publish in high visibility venues. So this may be stepping outside your comfort zone of your, of your traditional journals that you publish in, but looking at science and nature and chronicle of higher ed that get a lot of eyeballs. Um, newspapers and editorial pages, uh, local news can be a good outlet for you to approach. Um, and also, you know, lead by example. Somebody has to, you might have to put your neck out on the line um, to affect change, but that also means that you support the other people who are doing this um, in order to, to help everybody out. Uh, then the broader engineering community. Uh, we do think there's a need to reach out and engage with the public. Um, I think there is a role, we think there's a role for the professional honorific societies to take visible stands on social and ethical issues. This is some examples given um, the medical community, their professional groups tend to take stands on current political issues and uh, current topics in society, and the engineering societies don't seem to do this. 
Uh, and then as we pointed out, the NAE itself could have a grand challenge on engineering ethics or embed the engineering ethics into the grand challenges that currently exist. And one last thing you could do is to attend the 2017 conference on values, medicine, science. <laughs> Values in science, in medicine, science, and technology. Uh, this is a center at the University of Texas at Dallas. It is run by Matt Brown, who is here. Um, and so we would love to have people come and attend, uh, give a presentation. So there is the information, and you can come see us. Um, we also have some flyers that are available if this interests you. So thank you very much. That was a brilliant plug. Okay, <laughs> questions or comments for this group? I just wanted to let you all know that um, reinforcing and expanding on all the points that you raised here is an article um, that's in online first now from Science and Engineering Ethics, or in for Science and Engineering Ethics, by Carl Mitchum and Elaine Englehart about a long history of uh, trying to develop these programs and both pitfalls and the uh, successes and et cetera, both at Colorado School of Mines and um, IIT and Oh, and Elaine's institution in Utah. And so I would commend that to you. It's in online first, so you can find it directly there. And it's going to be part of a special issue of science and engineering ethics that will be out sometime this year on uh, ethical issues in modern technical institutions. So that might be an additional support to go along with what you had to say. Okay. Thank you. And science and engineering ethics is another good place to publish your work. <laughs> oh, now the plug gates are open. <laughs> That's maybe something that um, C's could do would be to send out some of these citations for folks um, or even the articles if you're interested. Um, one more question or comment for this group? Thank you so much. Thank you.